I'm always scared when I do this part. <laughs> oh. awesome. I believe we are live now. So thank you all for being here today. Um, I noticed that the spotlight is on. So everyone who needs ASL, make sure that you know that we do have Andrea with us today. And I believe we have also Amanda that will be joining us um, today. Danny Cage and I, I'm Teresa Rayford from Don't Shoot Portland are gonna be presenting to you our city of Portland's audit, auditor's office. Um, the focus of today is why audits matter. A lot of our work in the movement is to make sure that we understand how to seek accountability from our legislators and also lawmakers and local elected politicians. And the reason that we seek accountability is because a lot of people have concerns and have ideas about things that need to happen in our community so that everybody is centered in access. And when that doesn't happen, it's always important for us to use our voices to engage with civics so that the things that are necessary are um, redirected or become a part of the essential need of serving all Portlanders. Um, today, we're going to be getting information from the council clerk and the ombudsman, and I'll let them introduce themselves. And we'll be, after each presentation, we'll have time for Q&A. So if you have any comments or questions, please make sure to leave them in the chat box here on YouTube. Also, subscribe to our channel. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tressa. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to take a quick minute here and share my screen. I have a couple slides I want to share. Okay, so thank you again for this opportunity to meet with all of you and spend a little time talking about the council clerk's office. My presentation will take about 20 minutes, which will leave some time at the end for any questions that might come up for you. My name is Keelan McClymont and I'm the council clerk. Uh, if you have ever watched a council meeting in the past year and a half, you may have seen my name on the screen and heard my voice reading the titles of agenda items and calling the votes. When in-person council meetings start up again, I will be the person sitting at the clerk's desk in council chambers in City Hall. I have been working in the auditor's office for a little over three years. Most of my work history has been spent in the public sector. Before coming to work at the city, I worked at Multnomah County, and before that, the Department of Veterans Affairs. I love working in local government because I care deeply about the city and the people who live here. We all know that at this time in history, Portland is a difficult city to live and work in, and there are a lot of problems. Even with all of that, I feel really encouraged about the future of the city because I work with people in the auditor's office and in other bureaus across the city who come to work every day to try to come up with solutions to help the city and to help Portlanders get through this really hard time. The council clerk is responsible for administering city council business. This includes preparing and publishing the weekly council agenda, which is published Friday morning by 9 a.m. on our website. We review the documents submitted for the agenda to make sure they are complete and include all the required approvals. We record all the actions that council takes on the agenda items they consider, including how they vote. We make sure that the decisions that council makes during meetings are available to the public on our website and in our records and archive system called e-files. The clerk is present at every council meeting and is responsible for calling the roll to record which council members are present in the meeting. Uh, the clerk is responsible for reading the titles of agenda items for recording the motions made by council and the votes for each motion and agenda item. Other responsibilities of the council clerk team include being the central location for city contracts and maintaining city charter and city code. And you can think about the charter as being the constitution for the city of Portland and the code is all of the laws that govern decision-making in city government. Um, I'll spend a little bit more time talking about city charter in just a minute because there is something uh, special happening right now in the city that only happens every 10 years. 
The council clerk team is part of the auditor's office. The auditor is the sixth elected official at the city and is independent from other city elected officials. Other divisions in the auditor's office includes archives and records management, independent police review, audit services, ombudsman, and city elections. It is very important that the work of the council clerk be neutral and unbiased. We strive very hard to support the members of council, their staff, city employees, and the public, but we do not work for city council, nor do we take direction from them. Sometimes there is confusion about the role of the council clerk being a secretary for the council, but the council clerk is accountable only to the auditor and the auditor is accountable to the public. I wanna share a little background information on how city government is organized. Uh, currently, Portland has a commission form of government and this differs from most other municipal governments in that its members have legislative, administrative, and quasi-judicial powers. Legislative power means the city council meets weekly to conduct the city's legislative business. And this includes adopting the city budget uh, and passing laws, policies, and regulations that govern the city. Administrative power means the mayor and the commissioners also oversee bureaus and they carry out policies approved by the council. The mayor assigns departments and bureaus to the other commissioners. And finally, quasi-judicial power means that council members, they hear land use cases and other types of appeals. The commission form of government was adopted in 1913. Portland is the largest city in the United States with this form of government. And the only way it can be changed is if Portlanders vote to change it. Over the years, Portlanders have voted to keep the commission form of government eight times. Every 10 years, city council convenes a charter commission to review and recommend changes to the city charter. The Charter Commission is made up of 20 people, and they right now are exploring big changes to our form of government and voting systems. Any changes they propose will be referred to the ballot, and Portlanders, like you, will vote on those proposed changes. If you want to learn more about what the Charter Commission is doing, there are lots of ways to get involved. You can submit written public comments about what issues are important to you. You can watch all of the meetings and review the minutes. You can sign up to provide verbal public comment at the commission meetings, and you can stay connected by signing up to receive regular updates. City Council is made up of five commissioners, and the mayor is considered a commissioner. All city elected officials are elected at large on a nonpartisan basis and they serve four year terms. Elections are staggered with the mayor and commissioners number one and four elected one year and the auditor and commissioners numbers two and three elected two years later. This May and November, Portlanders will vote for a new auditor and for commissioners number two and three. Currently, Commissioners Ryan and Hardesty hold those positions and they are both running for re-election against other candidates. Earlier, I mentioned uh, the meeting agenda, which my office is responsible for publishing each week there is a council meeting. In addition to the items council will discuss, the agenda contains all the information you need to know about the upcoming council meeting, including uh, what time the meeting starts, which council members will be in attendance, how to sign up to provide testimony at the meeting, and what agenda items you can sign up for. Every council meeting is live streamed to YouTube on the city's channel, eGov PDX. The meetings are also available to watch on Channel 30 and on the CityNet channel on the OpenSignal website. Because of COVID, 
council meetings are being held virtually, but Portlanders can still join meetings to provide testimony on agenda items that are important to them. My office can help answer any questions you have about joining the virtual meeting. We want to do everything we can to make sure you can share your concerns and provide feedback to council about the decisions they are making. Council meetings are held on Wednesday mornings starting at 930 and they go until all of the agenda items have been heard. If there is more business for council to discuss, another meeting will be scheduled at 2 p.m. on Wednesday and then again at 2 p.m. on Thursday if necessary. If you're wondering why council meetings are held in the middle of the day, in the middle of the work week, you're not alone. We understand that these are terrible times for city council to be meeting and making decisions that impact Portlanders. Since many Portlanders are working or going to school or taking care of young children or other family members during these times. We know that it's very hard to take time off of school or work to come to council. And we know that because of this, there are voices in Portland that are not being heard at council. We also know that this meeting schedule was set by decision makers in the past who were operating in a society rooted in a system of white supremacy that actively sought to limit the voices of black people, indigenous people, and people of color. One way city council can address this inequity is to schedule meetings in the evening. City council can exercise this option whenever they want. They just have to provide two weeks notice that they will schedule a council meeting in the evening. If this is something that is important to you and having evening council meetings would make it easier for you to participate please tell members of city council that you want them to meet in the evenings so more Portlanders can participate and be heard. Two years ago, when the pandemic started, city council started meeting virtually. Many local governments realized that offering a virtual option for members of the public to participate in council meetings made it easier for people to be able to provide testimony at meetings. A person can join the meeting on their phone, their tablet, or their computer from almost anywhere, uh, including home, work, a coffee shop, a park, or their car. If they are at work, they can join the meeting on their break or their lunch and provide their testimony. And they don't need to take time off or drive down to City Hall or take a bus or bicycle or walk. And they don't need to find and then pay for parking just to be able to participate in the meeting. As a result, starting this past January, the Oregon state government passed a law that requires all public meetings, including city council, to always provide a virtual option for members of the public to participate in the meetings. This means that when council starts meeting in person again, there will also be a virtual option. We're calling these types of meetings hybrid meetings. My office wants to make sure that Portlanders know that this option is available and how to use it. The mission of the auditor's office is to inform and empower Portlanders so we may hold city government accountable and work to earn the trust of the community. One way the council clerk team works to achieve these goals is to make sure every Portlander is able to engage with their elected officials. And how do we help you engage with city council? We provide you information about the topics that city council will discuss and vote on by publishing the agenda for every council meeting. Many of the items on the agenda are open for public testimony, which means if you see an item on the agenda that will impact you, your family, your business, or your neighborhood, you can tell city council what concerns you might have, or maybe that you support the action being proposed but you think an important issue has been overlooked. You can provide this testimony in a couple different ways. You can sign up to provide testimony to council during the meeting. 
Generally, members of the public will have three minutes to share with council why they support or oppose the agenda item being considered. On this slide, you can see an example of an agenda item from a recent council meeting that has the option to register to provide testimony. When you register, you will be asked to enter your name, contact information, and the agenda item or items you want to speak on. You will then receive an invitation to join the meeting using your phone or the internet. In the meeting, when the item is being discussed, the clerk will call your name and then you can share your comments with council. If you want to present an issue to council that is not related to a specific agenda item, you can sign up for a communication. At the beginning of every Wednesday morning council meeting, there are five communication spots that can be reserved in advance by Portlanders. Each communication spot is three minutes long and the individual may present any topic or concern they have to council. Signing up for a communication is easy and it only takes a couple minutes. You will find an easy to use form on our website that tells you when the next available spot is and asks you to fill out your name, contact information, and the topic you want to present to council. This slide shows a couple examples of communication topics. When we hear from members of the public that they are not able to get in touch with their elected officials, we will often recommend that they sign up for a communication to be able to connect directly with all members of council at one time during a meeting. Anyone can sign up for a communication, including young people. Some of the most compelling testimony I have heard at council has been delivered by young people just like you who are passionate and care deeply about an issue. And I will tell you that members of council listen when young people show up to testify. If you don't wanna speak in front of council during a meeting, you can provide written testimony. You can send an email to our office and we will distribute that testimony to members of council and their staff. And then the written testimony is added to the public record. You may also send comments directly to city council members using the contact and elected official form. You might be wondering, how do I sign up to testify or provide written testimony if I don't have email or if I don't really use the internet? This is an easy one. You can call us at 503-823-4082 and we can help you. Please feel free to leave a message on the voicemail and, and we'll call you right back. When the council clerk team started talking about how we could help to make sure all Portlanders understand how to engage with city council, we realized we needed to better understand which Portlanders were already engaging with council through testimony and communications at meetings. We started asking people who signed up to participate in council meetings to tell us their zip code. We analyzed the zip codes we collected in 2020, and I just wanted to share with you what we found. 77% of the people who provided testimony to council shared their zip code with us. 73% of those individuals provided Portland zip codes. The map on the right shows the Portland zip codes that had the highest number of Portlanders providing testimony at council meetings. These are the dark areas on the map. The lighter areas are zip codes that had fewer numbers of Portlanders participating at council. Then what we did was we overlaid the zip code data with an equity matrix developed by the Bureau of Transportation that measures race, ethnicity, and income, and uses those measurements to rank census tracts based on those factors. 
On this map, the light purple areas represent zip codes where Portlanders have higher incomes and are less diverse. The darker purple and gray areas represent zip codes where Portlanders have lower incomes and are more diverse. This map shows us that in 2020, the areas in Portland where the highest number of Black, Indigenous, and people of color lived were the areas that had lower numbers of people signing up to testify at council meetings. And these are the red circles on the map. We can see that people who live in East Portland and North Portland don't engage with city council as much. And my team is asking why that is the case. Is it due to lack of transportation to be able to come to city hall or because the hours that council meets are in the middle of the day? Is there a language barrier? Is the lack of childcare a contributing factor? What about distrust of local government? We are finishing up the zip code analysis for 2021, and we are seeing similar results, that the people who testify the most at city council are from areas in Portland that are wider and have higher incomes. And this is not representative of the population in Portland. The voices of the people who live in the upper underrepresented zip codes are the voices that need to be heard at city council. We also know that zip code data by itself doesn't tell us the whole story. So this year, we have started to ask those who sign up to testify at council to answer an optional question that asks them to identify their race and ethnicity. We are doing this because we want to better understand whose voices are being heard so we can improve our outreach to Portland communities of color and provide information and assistance for how to engage with city council. I am so grateful uh, that I had this opportunity to share information with you about the work we do in the council clerk's office. My team includes three superheroes who show up to work every day, guided by the belief that every Portlander should be able to engage with their elected officials as much or as little as they want. That all Portlanders should be able to understand and have an impact on the decisions that city council is making. And that everything we do in our positions and that with everything we do in our positions, we work to hold ourselves accountable to Portlanders so we can help Portlanders have more confidence and trust in city government. We are here to help you with any questions you have about how to participate in council meetings. Please don't hesitate to contact us by email at councilclerk at portlandoregon.gov. You can also call us and we can help you with signing up for a communication or providing testimony at a council meeting or anything else related to engaging with city council. If you have friends or family or neighbors who speak another language or use sign language, we can provide interpreters during the meeting to make sure that everyone can be heard at city council. Call or email us with the request for an interpreter. Uh, we always appreciate getting the request uh, three days before the meeting so we can make sure that someone is available. Um, I would love to hear any questions you might have, um, and if I'm not able to answer your questions, I will track down an answer for you once we're finished. Thank you so much, Keelan. Um, I'm just back on. Thank you so much, Keelan. And hello, Amanda. Um, Amanda is the ASL for now. And Danny, did you have any questions? That was a lot of information. And thank you for bringing it to us in such an accessible and radical way. Um, I'm thankful that you uh, considered the facts that a lot of people don't attend the city council meetings and that you gave information on different ways that we can be involved in making that happen. That was really great. 
Um, Danny, did you have any questions or thoughts about the information? Yeah, I'm, a, um, I'm curious, like, how do you view your job um, with the auditor's office um, with accountability for the city? Yeah, thanks for that question, Danny. Um, so as I said, the auditor is the sixth elected official um, and is independent from council. So because the council clerk and my team, we are in the auditor's office, that means that the work we do is we are accountable to the auditor because she is our director and, and the auditor in turn is accountable to the people of Portland, the voters, and that's who she is accountable to. So ultimately I see my role as being accountable to the people of Portland. Um, and I, I, myself and my team, we work very, very hard um, in our positions and in the council meetings themselves to be very neutral um, and unbiased. And ultimately, you know, we, we hold that responsibility to the people of Portland very, very highly. Okay, and so I think, well, um, I'm gonna enjoy being able to share this video um, later on so that some of those people that'll be able to see it later on this evening will have a chance. Uh, would we be able to still make sure that we link the information so that you would be able to answer those questions? Um, and obviously you said we could, so excuse me for my nervousness. Um, I guess, we're, are we ready for the next uh, presentation from the ombudsman? Awesome, thank you. Yes. Yeah, let me just get my screen going. <clears throat> so thanks everyone for being here today. Um, oops. You'd think after two years of working remotely that I'd have this down pat, but it takes me a little bit every time. Um, I'm Elizabeth Martinez. I'm a deputy ombudsman for the city of Portland. Um, I feel very grateful uh, to be here to share the space with you today and to give a little bit of information about the work that um, the ombudsman team does for the city of Portland and for Portlanders. Um, so I'll give a brief introduction into what the ombudsman role is, um, give a of our work because uh, it's one of those roles that's a little bit easiest to understand through actual examples um, and then leave some time at the end uh, for some questions and comments. Um, if for some reason any questions come up as I'm going along, uh, please feel free to write those in the chat and uh, hopefully Danny or Teresa can field those for us. <clears throat> um, so as Keelan mentioned, the ombudsman is under the auditor's office. Um, so we're under um, Mary Hull Caballero, who is the current um, city auditor. Um, and this is again important uh, for an independent function. So um, as you'll learn, the ombudsman uh, conducts investigations into city bureaus uh, to make sure that city bureaus are treating Portlanders fairly. Uh, so it's really important for us to be uh, kept separate from the other bureaus. Uh, so we um, are accountable to Mary, uh, the auditor, and to Portlanders, um, and so we can really investigate the other bureaus um, from an impartial, independent perspective uh, that allows our investigations uh, to have much more credi credibility and integrity. Um, as you can imagine, um, it's more difficult to really scrutinize or be critical of an organization that you are a part of. Uh, so being separate, we can uh, take a much more critical and uh, scrutinizing lens uh, when we're investigating um, city bureaus. Uh, so the ombudsman, uh, if you haven't heard of this name, uh, you are not alone. Uh, I had no idea what an ombudsman was uh, before I applied to this position. Uh, so I was looking for a new job and I came across this job posting um, and I learned what an ombudsman was. Um, so our kind of uh, slogan tagline is that it's a funny name, but it's serious work. Uh, so at the ombudsman's office, uh, we are kind of uh, the city of Portland watchdog. So we're really here to make sure you all, all of Portlanders, anyone who interacts with Portland city government is treated fairly. 
Uh, so we advocate for fairness, justity, uh, just, fairness, justice, and equity in city services and practices. Um, and again, we primarily do this uh, by taking complaints from the public. Uh, so um, complaints will come into our office. Um, we will do an intake, you know, get all of the information that we need, the who, what, when, where, how, um, and we'll also ask individuals what type of solution are they looking for. Um, and then we investigate these complaints. Um, and we gather all the information that we need, whether that's data or documents or interviewing folks. Um, and then when we find issues uh, or problems or areas where uh, the city was unfair, uh, we identify ways to resolve the issues. Uh, so one thing I really like about my role is that it's not just about identifying problems. Uh, that is a key very important uh, part of the job, uh, but we also are then um, have a role of pushing for change, uh, finding solutions where we can, um, and advocating for those solutions. <clears throat> um, I also really love um, that this role is very values-based. So again, our um, kind of main allegiance is to fair government, um, and so we're able to be critical and scrutinize government. Um, under those values. Um, so our office is small but mighty. Um, there is the city ombudsman uh, who is Margie Sollinger. Uh, she joined the city as the ombudsman in 2012 and she has a law background. Um, it's really common for folks with lots of different uh, education or professional backgrounds to come to the ombudsman role. Um, so Margie has a, a law degree, so she's able to really understand how city government works and is structured, um, as well as any legal issues that arise. Uh, Tony Green is the other deputy ombudsman. Uh, he has been here since 2015, um, and he has an investigative journalism background. Uh, so as you can imagine, as we're doing investigations, he has a really strong, robust skill set in asking the tough questions, getting to the root of the problem and getting to the answers. Um, I just joined the office in 2021. So I'm just under a year of being a deputy ombudsman. Um, and I have a different background than either Tony or Margie. Um, I actually come from more of a research background. Uh, so I have a PhD in sociology uh, where I focused on um, um, how implicit biases kind of uh, permeate through organizations and lead to unequitable outcomes across uh, different social characteristics, uh, primarily race, ethnicity, and gender, uh, immigrant status. <clears throat> um, so I come to this role uh, looking at uh, issues and cases always with kind of a system level approach in mind. I think through um, how organizations and institutions can be structured in ways that lead to unequitable or unjust um, or unfair outcomes um, and that those can be patterned. So it might not just impact one person, it could be pervasive and impacting a whole group of people or whole groups of people. Um, so I, I tend like to uh, view cases that way. Even if I'm hearing this from one person, um, is it possible that this is a wider problem and should we look for that as well? Should we look to see whether this is systemic and patterned. So we'll talk about some cases uh, that kind of um, exemplify that. <clears throat> so when we get complaints, um, oftentimes they'll be just individual complaints. Uh, these are situations where um, an individual will come to us, they can call us, um, when our office is open, they can come into the office, uh, they can email us, um, and we have an online form. So an individual brings their complaint to us, um, and we look into it, and we can uh, work to resolve uh, that individual complaint. Uh, so one common example is um, an individual who may have had their car towed. Um, so cars can be towed for many reasons, but in one instance, for example, a person had their vehicle towed, um, sorry, their vehicle was stolen 
and then uh, parked in an illegal spot. And then their vehicle was then towed um, to a private lot that the city contracts with. Uh, so this was the situation where a person uh, was the victim of a crime, uh, but then they lost their vehicle um, uh, via a tow and were in the, unable to get it out because the fees started racking up uh, quite quickly and they didn't have the money or the resources to pay to get their, their car out. Uh, so in a case like this, when that person comes to us and tells us what's happening to them, uh, we can go to the bureau that had the vehicle towed and explain the situation and say, this is a person who's a victim of a crime. They don't have the resources to pay for their vehicle, but this vehicle is very important to their livelihood. Uh, these fees should be waived because it was not their fault that their vehicle was uh, uh, stolen and towed. So that's a situation where uh, our office um, comes in, here's the complaint, sees that it's unfair, and then we go uh, to the decision makers involved, so the, those in the city who can remedy the situation, and we advocate for our recommendation. So in a situation like this, it's uh, recommending that all fees be waived. Um, so that makes up a lot of our caseload. It's individual complaints uh, that we're able to resolve for that individual that came forward. Um, we're more moving more towards, however, also doing more systemic reform cases. Uh, so these are cases where the system or the process or the policy is impacting uh, many people or many groups of people, or it's having unequal impacts on certain groups of people um, and pushing for change so that the policy or practice um, is changed. Um, and so it's no longer having that broad pattern um, disparity, um, inequality, inequity. Uh, an example of this is um, the lead-based paint uh, demolition practices or deconstruction practices. Uh, there was, was a complaint where a policy was being put forth uh, that certain homes that had high lead paint uh, would have to be deconstructed so that the lead would, dust would be contained. So this is really important because lead uh, based paint is uh, very bad for you. Um, and so um, containing lead paint during uh, demolition um, is really important for the health of the community. Um, however, we received a complaint that it was um, not being uh, written in a way to protect all Portlanders. So um, our office looked into it and did find indeed that, that the way the policy was structured it was protecting neighborhoods that were wider and that had um, uh, more economic resources, so it was wealthier. Uh, so in those neighborhoods, in those homes, um, areas in those homes, uh, they had to deconstruct the homes in a way to contain the lead dust. But in other areas that were predominantly Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities and the lower economic um, communities, the policy wasn't going to be put in place. So those communities would not be protected from lead paint. Um, so our office stepped in in this regard and advocated for the policy uh, to be revised, to make sure that all Portlanders, regardless of where you live, regardless of uh, your race or ethnicity, um, would be protected by policies uh, geared toward um, containing lead, lead dust. <clears throat> so to give um, a little bit, bring this all a bit more to life, I'm gonna show a brief video um, from the news media that covered one of the cases. Um, and it's a good example of an individual complaint that came in that we resolved uh, for that person, for that woman, that individual, um, but it also is tied to uh, more of a systems level issue. People are struggling, and the city of Portland is trying to help. Find them housing, a job, a way to meet their essential needs. 
But at the same time, I've found the city may be undermining some of those efforts and actually making it more difficult for people to get back on their feet by sending them to a private debt collector without considering how much they owe or the challenges they face. My name is Trayla Lomax. I'm 30 years old, born and raised in Portland, Oregon. I'm a single mother of three. The city of Portland sent Trayla Lomax to collections because she owed $5,000 for damages after an accident with an unmarked police car. Trayla doesn't have that kind of money. She's a domestic violence survivor who works part-time, receives food stamps, and lives paycheck to paycheck. And at that time, we were, it was, unbeknownst to them, we were homeless, so it was just really hard. And the consequences of not paying only increased because collections tacked on interest and fees. As time goes on, the money keeps going and it gets higher and higher and higher. And that is even a more discouraging thing to face because you're like, okay, well, you find a plan for maybe the $5,000. Then when the interest occurs and it's $7,000, and it's like, well, you know, what do I do? On top of that mounting debt, Trela's credit score took a hit, making it more difficult to rent an apartment. And it put a lot of barriers and boundaries in front of me when I was applying to move into places. Um, applying for jobs, wanted to move, get in a car, things like that. It was just very hard because it was a big strike on my credit. Trayla felt defeated. It wasn't a fair fight. And just think, I'm one of who knows how many. That's the bigger issue. It's like, I'm just one person. A closer look at public records found since 2015, the city has sent 157,000 accounts to a private third-party collection agency called Ray Klein, or Professional Credit Service, in hopes of getting back more than $32.8 million in unpaid bills. Of that money owed, only about 14% has been recovered. Which presents an interesting question. Is this practice cost-effective? Is it worth it? Knowing the consequences of sending someone to collections is significant. There's no benefit. When the city goes after people who have no money and no assets, the city is not getting paid. So the only thing that's happening is the person is getting punished. Margie Solinger is the city ombudsman, sort of like a public watchdog at City Hall. It's not a humane system the way that we're approaching it. I don't know that it's intentional, but that is certainly the effect. The city doesn't have a collections policy. There's no single rule. Instead, every bureau decides on its own when to send people to an outside collection agency. For example, the Revenue Division sends people if they owe $100 or more, but the Water Bureau refers people to collections for much smaller amounts. We found since 2016, the Water Bureau sent more than 300 accounts to collections for $50 or less. Some people who owed as little as $25 were referred to a private collection agency. It's just creating a bad domino effect, a down, downhill spiral for people that are trying to accomplish better things financially. After looking at Trela's case, the ombudsman stepped in and asked the city to forgive the debt. Trela couldn't pay, and sending her to collections was only making a bad situation worse. The city agreed and decided to drop the debt and cease collections. I feel blessed. I'm blessed. This is beyond luck. Despite her damaged credit, Trela's confident she can move forward in life and hopes others can follow by removing this financial barrier. It's changed my life. It's changed my life. By establishing criteria for when people are sent to collections and evaluating their ability to pay, the city of Portland can help those on the brink get back on their feet. Okay, so, oops, sorry. <clears throat> So that was a good example of one case that it came in uh, as an individual complaint. Um, but as you saw in that video clip, it tied into larger issues about how is the city addressing uh, sending folks to collection. And as Margie, the city ombudsman mentioned in that clip, it's not a humane system. Um, it's going after folks that do not have the resources uh, to pay. So it's uh, effective, um, but it's also having consequences in their lives that are very real and that are unjust and unequal and unequitable. Um, 
so that was a case we solved individually uh, for Trela, as you've heard. Um, but it is a case that has, again, systemic issues uh, that we will be looking into. Um, uh, and it's one of many cases that we're starting to take a systems level approach to. Um, or coupling, solving the individual complaint while also then looking into the system level reform. Um, as you can imagine, that system level reform work takes a bit longer. It requires us to pull a lot of data and information, analyze it, uh, interpret the results, and then um, make recommendations based off of what we found. Um, but we are doing it. It takes us a little longer as a team of three, but that's the, the direction we're going with uh, many of our complaints. Um, an example of that, that we just um, came out with a public report on uh, at the end of last year had to do uh, with the Portland's uh, property maintenance enforcement. So these are um, enforcement violations that have to do if your grass is too long uh, and you're a property owner, if you, the, the paint on your house is peeling um, and uh, people can call in and make complaints about someone's house. Um, so for instance, a neighbor can call and say, my neighbor's house has grass that's too long, the paint is peeling, you know, it's unsightly. Um, that person who had that code violation can then be fined and a lien can be taken out on their home. And these fines just increase um, quite rapidly where all of a sudden there'll be thousands of dollars um, in fees that this property owner um, is responsible for. Um, and that we found that the mo most of the complaints were in areas that were gentrifying and that um, had high um, proportions of black indigenous and people of color living there. Uh, so our argument was that this code enforcement policy, it's kind of uh, being weaponized or used against uh, certain uh, communities and uh, putting them in really uh, dire situations that is unjust and inequitable. Uh, so we, in that instance, we came out with a public report that got media attention to put pressure kind of on the bureau, um, on city council to draw attention that this is a policy that needs to be changed. Um, so we made recommendations for them to put, um, you know, a committee together to look into um, changing how that policy is structured um, and maintained and how um, to make sure that uh, city policy in regards to property maintenance um, is not, um, you know, uh, being used against uh, BIPOC communities. <clears throat> um, another somewhat different example um, from um, summer of uh, <clears throat> 2020 was um, uh, during uh, so many of the protests that were happening, um, we got a complaint that made us aware that uh, Portland Police Bureau had stopped um, recording their tactical channel, um, which uh, we found to be very problematic because uh, speaking of accountability, making sure that we have recordings of police activity is one way to keep, uh, have accountability uh, for the Portland uh, policing. Um, so we ensured um, and spoke with leadership over at Portland Police Bureau, um, and um, they agreed to start uh, start recording those again. Um, and um, yeah, we were, they agreed to do so. So we made sure that those are recorded uh, for accountability measures. Um, this is also a good uh, time for me just to note that um, our office does not have jurisdiction over uh, Portland uh, police officer misconduct. Uh, as you may be aware, that falls under the independent police review, uh, but we can look into uh, administrative acts of the Portland Police Bureau. So in this case, you know, the, the, the decision to record or not record certain activity, that's something our office can uh, speak to or work on. Um, so that's one example of how we interact with the Portland Police Bureau. <laughs> Uh, so with that, I'll end there. 
uh, open it up for any comments or questions. Um, and we are always looking uh, to hear more from folks. Um, even if you're not sure if our office can help you, uh, one thing we take very seriously as ombudsmen um, is to make referrals as needed. So if someone comes to us and they have a problem that they're facing, um, if I can't help them or if Margie or Tony can't help them, uh, we take really seriously um, putting that person in contact with whoever can help them. So we're happy to make referrals as needed. Awesome, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, that information was just so interesting and we were getting really good feedback from the stream on Instagram. There's people saying, oh, thank you for sharing this. And you know, I think that they're learning so much about what's going on. I wanted to ask before we open up for Danny, um, I wanted to ask like with some of the information that's contained in these audits and with the access that you have through the ombudsman, um, with our organization, a lot of times we like to get people access to legal support and we've even mm -hmm. you know, researched things in the auditor's office or in some of the reports, um, you know, back in the day, um, probably, you, um, let's say pre-COVID, <laughs> when I could go in there and grab books and everything like that. But we would use that information to share with our community so that they could figure out different ways uh, to seek accountability. And I was wondering, um, how, do, how do people use this to kind of like, I know that there's a systemic approach to it, through the mm -hmm. ombudsman's office uh, to kind of rectify some of these wrongs. But do you think that uh, the courts is also a way that we can use some of this information to kind of seek and redress some of the issues? Because sometimes, um, you know, the system through bureaucracy will state that there's not a re enough resources in order to create change. But mm -hmm. when you see the systemic abuse of these policies really affecting the lives of people and especially those people that are most vulnerable to the, you know, the upholding of white supremacy. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's like, where do we find, where do we find support? How do we use the work that y'all are doing to take it to the next level? Yeah, I think that's a great point, Teresa, and a great question. Um, I think the legal system, yeah, has such an important role to play in this. I think some of our public reports might come in handy for an individual or group of individuals who may be uh, pursuing that route. Um, and, and we have case examples um, on our website um, and make um, our public reports available. Um, there's um, also links to a number of media that have covered some of our cases that can be helpful, I think, when people are trying to, uh, I don't know, gather support or evidence for the issue that they're raising. Um, they can also always contact us and ask us if we have any information that we're able to share. Um, our investigations are confidential, uh, except for most our outcomes and recommendations aren't. So there's certain information we have to keep confidential and that's important for us, you know, for the people that are coming to us that we, they entrust us with their confidentiality. Uh, but if folks have uh, questions on information we may have, or if we've had a case that might be helpful for them. We're um, big proponents of transparency and accountability. So we're always helpful to share whatever information we may have. Um, and we, a lot of complaints we do get um, are people asking us to help them get public records. So we're happy to help people get the public records that they need. Awesome. I really love the work that y'all put into these um, presentations and it makes me excited about Wednesday. Uh, Danny, did you have any questions or takeaways, thoughts about today? Um, not any questions, but I do, I did love hearing how um, this role kind of uh, was able to facilitate accountability um also to facilitate um and address like racial inequities which we know we have a lot of in the city um and we will continue to need to fix yeah i guess the last thing i'll say that i should have said already but we are a bit complaint driven so we respond to the complaints we receive and like keelan mentioned we know we're only hearing from a certain subset of Portlanders. And we would love to hear from more Portlanders. Um, we can initiate uh, investigations on our own accord. So we don't have to have a complainant, 
but it's so helpful to know what are the concerns of Portlanders. How are Portlanders interacting with the city government in ways that are not serving Portlanders well? And the more information our office has, we can do the digging that we need to do to make sure that Portlanders are served well. So um, yeah, any questions or any concerns, or even if you're not quite sure if it matches up with the city of Portland or our jurisdiction, it's just really helpful for us to hear more, um, hear more often from Portlanders and from uh, more um, diverse Portlanders and all Portlanders. Um, and uh, we're also open to feedback. So if we're not, if we're doing something and are not reaching out in a way that we need to be doing, if we're not coming to the table in a way uh, that is appropriate or approachable or um, uh, helpful, then we're open to hearing that. Awesome. Um, I was going to say that one of the first times um, outside of getting research materials from the auditor's office that I did use the, um, the process of having a communication item was after the death of Qantas Hayes, because obviously mm -hmm. city council, the mayor, no one wanted to address the family and to speak to them directly. So uh, me and Donna Hayes put our names down <laughs> for a communication item. And we're able to have the city council, you know, focus directly with the families and the communities affected by um, the shooting of that child by Portland police in 2017. And so um, I've always seen it as an effective measure to get their attention outside of protest, having our protests mm -hmm. and, and leading protests to organize people around certain issues is a good way to get people to understand where to go with that call to action because it doesn't end when, you know, when the protest is over, that's just the beginning of the call to action. But I think that what you have in that space um, in regards to, for us to have access to, there's a lot of uh, treasures and they're not hidden. They're there in plain mm -hmm. sight, but we just need to know how to get access to them. So I really do appreciate all of the work that you did in bringing this programming to us and tailoring it for our communities. And I'm hopeful that once we're able to get this information out, you know, past our social medias and YouTube, um, that people are gonna be responding in ways that are necessary. Because I think that once one person gets their situation addressed, that that creates an opportunity for president, for other people to also do that. Um, I recognize the woman in the video. My daughter was like, you're gonna mm -hmm. say that's our cousin, but it's my sister's <laughs> cousin. And I was like, that's Trayla. And I'm just thinking like so many people don't know that you exist, but once they do find that opportunity, it's the next best thing to having a lawyer. <laughs> so um, <laughs> thank you so much. Anybody else had anything that they wanted to say before we meet back up on Wednesday? And I know we'll have different people from your office that day, but any last words? All right, well, thank you all for being here and thank you for spending the first day of spring breakout but don't shoot Portland, our Black Lives, Black Lives Matter and Black Futures Forward programming has been going on since 2015. And Danny, thank you for being here today. Um, I hope you get a chance to re-watch this program and then maybe me and you can connect on some of the parts that would probably help out with the work that you do in community. And thank you all. Thanks for everybody that tuned in. Thank you for our ASL interpreters. And thank you to the city of Portland's auditor's office and the ombudsman's office. office. Ah. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.